So let me just quickly introduce Gabriel. So who is he a little bit? Um, so he is a polyglot. He speaks many languages. I'll let him talk a little bit more about how many languages he speaks. He has actually over 50,000 students. So he's a language teacher as well. And he has a YouTube channel where he shares all of his um, languages that he knows and all of his um, teachings with his students with over 300,000 people. Um, so I'll just jump off camera and I'll let Gabriel introduce himself and talk a little bit more. Sounds good. Thank you, Bridget. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. And uh, I see that we got some amazing teachers just from reading a little bit of the descriptions there. So my name, my name is Gabriel, I was born and raised in Brazil, and then I moved to Canada when I was 17. And uh, it, it took me a long time to just really get to a really good level uh, in English. So I just always thought that I wasn't that great a language learner. And uh, it was just much later on in, in my life, in, in my uh, early 20s, that I started learning French and German at the same time. And uh, when I reached uh, B2 in both of them, then I started exploring new languages. And, uh, and then eventually, uh, because of my passion for language learning, I essentially uh, started teaching as well. And, uh, and now I just, I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, progress in language learning. And I'm very passionate about like really uh, connecting with people uh, through language. And uh, on my YouTube channel, I, I always say, Languages connect people, and I like to show my interactions with people from uh, different countries in different languages, and uh, and that's something that I find that um, gets my students uh, excited because they see the potential in just connecting with others, and so on. And um, so I've been teaching for a little while now. Uh, I used to be more of a math teacher, and then I just started teaching more uh, languages and especially uh, English. And my my focus is really I have this obsession with uh progress really in language learning how can we how can we find progress how can i um you know be able to communicate with people and I, i've become uh obsessed especially with my students progress as well of course and uh and uh now um bridget can you uh go on to the next uh slide please uh can, there we go okay so, so i would say like let's start with this like uh I've um, I've met many high school students, especially that uh, have learned languages, or you know, they they basically taken a language course. So imagine a student, for instance, maybe in the states, and uh, let's say that he's he's excited about learning Spanish. Okay, so he's like, okay, I want to I want to learn some Spanish initially, maybe just for the idea of like, okay, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna go to Mexico, I'm gonna um order a beer with my friends when i when i turn uh, 18 or whatever the age of uh, drinking down in mexico is <laughs> and basically you know like but let's say that he's excited about learning spanish but then what happens is that you know then he's in the classroom and um he needs to study for an exam uh he he starts like basically studying vocab uh he starts to find find it a little bit more challenging than he imagined he he gets a bad grade his, his confidence starts to get a bit shot. He thinks like, oh, you know what? Maybe language learning isn't for me. Then he gets uh, even more anxious and stressed because there's more exams coming up. Uh, he thinks to himself like, oh my God, if I keep, if I'm not doing that well, then uh, I'm going to get like a bad uh, grade on my report card. My parents are going to be mad at me. So his confidence is shot. He's anxious about learning it. And um, and he's not really, you know, he's he doesn't have like that much confidence as a language learner, unfortunately, as he's just uh, uh, progressing. And uh, I uh, I'm going to talk about the effective filter from Stephen Krashen, uh, which is a, a basically the, the the effective filter hypothesis. And Stephen Krashen is just like this amazing. I'm, I'm sure that many of you uh, may already know him uh, and his work as an academic. And he's very uh, well respected in the in the polyglot community because uh, I personally really love his effect, uh, effective filter hypothesis, and um, and looking at the effective filter, which is basically um, actually Bridget, may I, should I keep asking you like this? <laughs> Next slide, please, please. Uh, so I'm going to talk about his effective filter, and and we're going to talk about like why that student is going to be in trouble in terms of actually absorbing material. 
But so first, of all, I'd like to add something else that I, I always like to talk about uh, in language learning, especially as a student, because uh, as Bridget mentioned, I'm a, an avid language learner and love learning new languages. And um, and something that I that I find, especially for myself, but I, I uh, employ it in whatever I try to do with my students as well, is always uh, have an element of, of play in language uh, learning. And um, and I put a picture of Nietzsche here, the, the German philosopher, <laughs> because I, I have this quote uh, from him in, uh, in German. It's, uh, alles Gute ist leicht, uh, alles Göttliche läuft auf zarten Füßen, which translates more or less to all that is good is light. Everything godly walks with uh, light feet. And my interpretation of this quote and the way that it would apply to language learning is that, you know, in order for us to master uh, something, especially a, a language, we have to have a big element of, uh, of lightness and, and, and play in language learning. So when it starts to become like really something stressful and, uh, and it's just like, oh, I, I have to learn that language. Otherwise, you know, then we, we don't really, we're not just, we're not just uh, not enjoying it. We're not just dreading it, but we're just going to absorb a lot less of the material as well, especially because a lot of my students are uh, Brazilian and they want to learn English and they feel like it's an absolute obligation. And unfortunately, many have already tried. Uh, they've done many different courses and, uh, and many of them haven't had a lot of success with the language learning process. So it becomes kind of like a, a heavy thing, you know, it just becomes like a, a stressful sort of like, oh, I, I got to learn this, but it's just maybe not for me. So that's why I always try to add this element of, of play and, 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 and joyfulness and lightness to language learning. And I think that that's something that uh, uh, Duo helps with as well, with because, <laughs> you know, it's a fun app. And I think that that's one of the reasons why, oh, we got the next slide already. That's good. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why the Duolingo is so successful in my eyes anyway. So Stephen Krashen's effective filter. There's three elements to the effective filter, and uh, and it's more or less like this: when the effective filter is really uh, is really high and it's really powerful, um, it will block out information. So we can basically get a lot of exposure to the language, or we can have a lot of lessons, or we can um, you know we can use an app or whatever we do. And unfortunately, if the filter is really high and really strong. Um, the information will not really cross, like it won't go through the filter and it won't reach our brain as much. So we won't be really absorbing as much information the way that we should. Um, but if we manage to lower the, the filter or weaken the filter, what's going to happen is that we're actually going to be able to absorb a lot of information and learn the, and learn the language a lot more effectively, right? And um, be it through just exposure or through lessons or, and, or with apps or whatever we're doing to learn the language, if we manage to weaken the effective filter, then uh, the information will go through the filter right into our uh, intelligent brains. So there are three factors to the uh, effective filter. Next slide, please, Bridget. Thank you. There we go. So there are three components to the effective filter based on... Uh, Stephen Krashen's uh, hypothesis. The first one is anxiety. So when we're anxious, oh no, please come back to the, the last. There we go. <laughs> uh, so there's three components. Yeah, all components are in the same on the same slide. <laughs> so the first uh, element is anxiety. So when we're anxious and we're learning a language, what's going to happen is that the filter is going to be more powerful. And uh, so if we're anxious. Uh, and we're not really enjoying the process, just like, for instance, like, uh, you know, like the student that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, he's, he wants to learn Spanish. Initially, he's excited, he's motivated, but, you know, the maybe the the situation, because he's got an exam coming up, he he feels like, uh, starts to feel anxious about getting uh, bad grades, then the, the anxiety will strengthen the filter, and he'll be learning a lot less, unfortunately. The second element is self-esteem, which, uh, you know, after getting a, a, a bad uh, grade, of course, unfortunately, a student will be 
um, will be, you know, take a take a, a bit of a hit on his or her self esteem as well. Let's say, like, a student gets a fails an exam or gets a C, they'll think like, oh, am I good at this? Like, am I good at language learning? Maybe I'm not meant for this. So if we have low self esteem, that strengthens the filter as well. So that's a, an inverse relationship, I guess. So if we have a lot of self esteem, of course, the the filter will be lowered. And we're going to be able to absorb and retain uh, more information. More information will come through the filter into our brains. And the third component is motivation. Of course, that's you know kind of obvious, I guess. But if uh, we are highly motivated to learn a language uh, and we're very excited about it, then what's going to happen is that the filter will be lowered as well. And then we're going to be absorbing a lot more uh, information. And... Um, and what we're going to do is that I'm going to especially uh, go deeper into student motivation because, uh, and that I'm, I'm very passionate about student motivation as well because I j don't just see it in my students, but I, it's something that I that I am always considering for myself as well as I learn the languages, and I see it uh, go up and down like a sine or a cosine curve all the time. Uh, sometimes I'm very, I'm very motivated, sometimes I'm not motivated at all. So we're going to take a look at um, basically the science behind self-motivation. And uh, we're going to take a quick look at three questions that uh, I believe uh, Dr. Scott Geller from uh, Virginia Tech um, basically proposed. And he's got a TED talk about this on YouTube. I highly recommend that uh, people can take a look at it because uh, especially for self-motivation in students, and for every, everything else in life, it's not just for language learning, of course. Three questions that we can answer to see um, if our uh, self-motivation is at a good level or not. And uh, so uh, first question that we can ask uh, to see if our motivation, self-motivation is at a good level, basically. Can I do it? Because I think I see a lot of students at the beginning, especially they they ask themselves that can i do this like I, I don't know if i can actually if they're not if they feel like the the tools that they're given are just not a uh either not good enough or not good enough for them or not suited to them um they, they're going to be asking really themselves like can i do it with these tools uh can i really succeed in this process can i learn a language Right. And, uh, and in order for, for the student to have a decent level of self motivation, he or she is going to have to be convinced that, yeah, it is possible and he or she can do it. Right. So I think that our roles as, as educators, of course, will be to um, show the students that it is possible for them. Right. Like that uh, they can do it. They're, they're going to be given the tools that are necessary to uh, succeed in this beautiful journey. Set, uh, question number two. Will it work? And that's a fantastic question, especially because a lot of my Brazilian students, they're uh, unfortunate. They've already, many of them feel that, that they've already failed at it um, because they've taken different courses, a lot of courses in Brazil that they, um, they go privately, right? So they, they go to these uh, English schools in Brazil. They're separate from the, um, the system, but of course, like from the high school system or at universities, they can do English as well. But normally, they go to a private school to learn English. They normally the courses focus very heavily on grammar, and often after years, many of them they can't really, they still can't like really communicate that well with foreign uh, with native speakers and so on. So a lot of them they 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 believe it won't work for them. Uh, not necessarily just for them, but like they 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 ask themselves, will this work? Will this process work? Will this is is this method the best? Right, so uh, we have to really, basically, help them uh, see that yeah, it will work. You know, like if you do the right things that we recommend, uh, and you're, you know, and of course, like if you like, one of the most important things, obviously, is just uh, um, what shall I call it, like uh, constancy, right? Like you have, if you do it a little bit every day, uh, if you have exposure to the language every day, and you're practicing and so on, it will, it will work for you. But if we have that doubt in our minds, like, will it work? I don't know. Then, of course, motivation is going to go way down. 
And the third question, which is a which is an amazing question, and I think one of the most important ones is, is if not the most important one, is it worth it? Right? Because ultimately, I think that um, you know, students are going to be in different situations. For instance, if uh, there's a student in the states in high school learning French or Spanish um, just to get like a credit for for high school, that's they may ask themselves like, well, is it going to be really worth it to to master the language or become or become fluent, or do I just want you know like the the credit for the for the course? Uh, or for instance, for one of my Brazilian students, a lot of them are like they know that it will be worth it because they they can see that it will make a big difference in their careers or, or you know their professional lives or um, even like at a social level they can like travel and meet people if they speak English, right? So they can see that it's worth it. But uh, in my eyes, at least, I think that um, as an educator, I really like try to light the fire in the student and really, and really convince them like, it's not, it's beyond worth it. Uh, mastering a, a second or a third language and perhaps going beyond if you so desire is uh, an amazing experience. So if the student is really convinced that it's truly worth it and uh, and so amazing to learn a language, of course, motivation is going to go uh, way up. And um, then we have to fuel the fire of motivation. Scott Geller proposes four uh, C's. Next slide, please. Here we go. Uh, so the four C's that can contribute to contribute to self-motivation. First, um, I changed the order of like when Scott Geller presents it differently, but of course, you know, I'm just presenting it in, a, uh, in my way. <laughs> the first one here will be community. So if, if students have a community, if uh, if they feel uh, like they can, they can help each other, for example, if, if a student has a buddy who's also learning um, a second or third language and they can go be in it together, uh, that is going to be an amazing thing that's going to boost motivation. And something cool about Duolingo, of course, is that, you know, there's the uh, I'm pretty competitive and I have like a 280 day streak, which is nothing compared to my mom's. That's like, she's got like, I think a 950 day streak or something learning French and German, <laughs> but you're always there competing. You can, you can have your friends there and stuff. So I think that that's like a really cool element. Um, community is of course important. And in a classroom, obviously, if, uh, if students are just like together in it and they're like, not just there to, you know, that get the credit or do or uh, get a good grade on um, the next exam. But if he or she can be really um, in it with their with their buddies, like, oh, you know, you know what? Like, let's let's actually just uh, uh, succeed in this together. That can be that can make a huge difference. And of course, like the teachers can help with that. Second one is competence, and that's related to. Um, basically you know the the one of the questions before uh for the three questions for self-motivation but we have to feel competent in uh, or competent enough in language learning right <laughs> and i think that we one way that we can do that is really like allowing the students to have little victories right to show like oh hey you know you actually you're competent enough to um really progress and uh and something actually fun for for example like about duolingo is that you know you can just you can get perfect on a lesson you're going to get fired up you're like oh yeah you know like or uh, i always do these timed lessons and uh when i beat them i'm like yes you know succeeded like if you like little victories can like really boost our perception of competence and i think that uh as a, as a teacher really like love to do that with uh with my students in whatever way i possibly can then the third C of motivation or to fire up motivation is the, the perception of choice, right? And why, why is the student doing it, right? And it, it can come down to like the choice of actually being in the course and learn, uh, language, uh, learning the language itself, um, but it can boil down even to the methods used or the, or the, or the material that the student is actually using. But ultimately, it's just kind of like, well, is the student uh, doing it because he or she wants to avoid failure? So for instance, oh yeah, like if, if I fail Spanish, 
then I, you know, may get held back a year or my parents would be mad at me and they won't let me travel. I don't know. Or is it to uh, go after success? And they're like, oh, you know what? Like if I learn a language, there's, uh, uh, that, that is a very exciting thing. I, I see like, you know, like I'm going to uh, have amazing consequences and consequences of the, the next C basically. But basically if the, the student has the perception of like, oh, you know what, like I'm choosing this because I actually want to uh, be successful. I want to speak the language, right? There's that perception of choice and not just like, a, oh, I got to do this. I got to be in this course because uh, I got no choice. Like uh, I, I want to avoid failure. So there's the perception perception of choice that the student, okay, you know what, like, no, I, I'm choosing to do this. Obviously he or she's going to be way more uh, motivated. And finally, consequences. What is the consequence to learning uh, a language? Now, here's, uh, this is one of the, for me, it's the biggest uh, C perhaps, because uh, I, I love to show my students that uh, like the, the massive, like awesome impact that speaking a language can have on their lives. And uh, on my YouTube channel, for example, like, you know, I, I basically have a lot of videos interacting with people. Uh, I have these funnier videos that I do. For instance, uh, I speak some Chinese. So I do these reaction videos sometimes. I just start a, a, a chat with a Chinese person in English. They don't know that I speak Chinese. Then I just switch into Chinese. And then they, you know, uh, they have like a very warm, uh, positive response. And I do that in different languages too. Um, and I like to show that to the students to just show like, you know what, like there are really amazing positive consequences to actually learning a language. Uh, that go beyond what uh, the student's imagination often, because sometimes it's just kind of like, oh yeah, you know, like I want to learn uh, whatever language because I just want to go to Mexico and be able to order a beer, or I want to go to France and order, uh, you know, get a, a croissant here in Paris and uh, have a little baguette by the Eiffel Tower or whatever. <laughs> I think that it's cr critical for us as uh, educators to just like really... Uh, fired up and, sh and show the students like how amazing the consequences can be to actually learning a language uh, successfully. Next slide, please. S'il vous plaît. S'il te plaît. Excellent. So a couple questions for you guys. First one, uh, in what ways do you help uh, your students lower the effective filter? So basically, uh, how do you lower, how do you help students lower their, their anxiety, boost their motivation, and increase their self-esteem? And also, how do you help students with self-motivation? Uh, and we can, we can consider the three questions as well as the four C's. Yeah, so this is for the dual plushie uh, giveaway. So if you want to do a plushie, um, take your time answering the, these two questions. And let us know a little bit about um, whether you know about the effective filter before or not, I still think that as educators, we all do something to lower that effective filter, whether you know it or not, to lower that stress and anxiety of your students. So let us know a little bit about what you do. Um, and then let us know a little bit about uh, self-motivation. So in what ways do you help your students boost their own self-motivation? Um, so like I said, take your time answering these questions. I'm going to choose two people randomly towards the end of the session. And so I'm going to, I'll send you a message then I'll send you a private message or email me or email you if you happen to, to leave, um, to let you know that you want our plushie. So, uh, we'll just take a look in the chat to make sure. So, Ooh, I create my own songs. Of course, Rigoberto. So we know Rigoberto is <laughs> a musician. So he creates his own songs. So that really helps your students feel comfortable. That's great to hear. Um, I also have them write down their personal goals and revisit them later. That's a really good one to have your students reflecting on those goals. I love that. Games, absolutely. Various types of games in the classroom. So keeping language learning fun and light for your students, stress-free. Absolutely. Make learning fun, interactive, giving students as much choice as possible to boost their motivation and interest. Ooh, yes. yes. Talked about that choice, how important that is. Absolutely. I, I would definitely give my students a lot of choice. I would play a lot of games. Um, and one thing too that I did in the classroom, um, and let me know whether or not Gabriel, if like this is something that you see often with your students, but I remember my students being very 
nervous to make mistakes. And I felt like that was a mm. huge uh, barrier to learning because we know as educators that making mistakes is simply how you learn. It's the name of the game and there's nothing to be embarrassed about that. So I really tried to foster that environment that taking risks is, is okay. And, and, and in fact, it's preferable in a learning, uh, a language learning environment um, and that making mistakes is okay as well. And I remember um, whenever I would make mistakes, I would be honest about those mistakes with my students. I remember another teacher, I like found a mistake that I had made on a worksheet and I was like, oh, I'm going to let my students know that, you know, I made this, I don't know what it was, a grammar mistake or something. And she was like, oh, you don't need to tell them. They're, they're not going to notice. And I was like, no, but I want to, because this is demonstrating to them that everyone makes mistakes, whether or not, you know, you're the teacher or not. Um, we're all still learning, especially with language, because it's, a living thing. We all make mistakes and it's changing constantly. I mean, I make mistakes in my native language, right? That's just, it's just normal. So how do you feel about making mistakes, Gabriel? Are your students kind of nervous to make mistakes? Oh yeah. Well, like, one interesting thing that happens in Brazil is that uh, uh, there's intense mockery normally when someone comes out and speaks English with an accent. And, you know, basically there was this a uh, really talented football or soccer coach who was Brazilian. And he was actually, I think he was the coach for South Africa uh, many years ago. And he did this interview in English with like a really ha heavy uh, accent, uh, Portuguese accent in uh, in English. And uh, the crazy thing is that, like, you know, he was understand. Well, at some, at some points he was not understandable actually, mm -hmm. which is okay. Cause I mean, like he was still like a, he was able to communicate with the, um, his players and do his job really well uh but oh my god basically he got roasted by the entire country and wow. uh, uh and that's just the general like so a lot of people do that and the funny thing is that often it's people who do not speak the language that well that like to mock others uh yeah. and be like oh your your english sucks like you know like but it's just kind of like well you, you barely speak too buddy actually in the reality right so yeah. the sad thing is that that triggers people like a lot of brazilians are really really insecure mm -hmm. about speaking or opening their mouths when it comes to speaking any english at all because they're afraid of being criticized intensely by random brazilians because like and the funny thing is that abroad that's not going to happen if they go to the states it's not like you know like you americans are just like so friendly when it comes to like you know uh and they're normally like foreign people are going to be like oh your accent's so cute or whatever, or whatever mm -hmm. right but so that's something that i always like try to uh tell my students and also like for example like in my in my lessons i don't uh correct them so i have this policy to not just like oh no hey that was a mistake so that you know i can normally just like uh normally rephrase the question or just like uh just reword what they they've said in a way and then like you know if they keep making the same mistake of course like i'll point it out like privately or whatever but uh but normally you know i i also, I also tell them listen i speak uh quite a few languages and i make many mistakes in all of them like uh you know like uh, i'm far from perfect in in uh all the all the languages that i that i speak so even uh languages that i speak relatively well like german and french I will make mistakes. So, yeah. you know, that's something that we got to accept and uh, and they make us uh, grow as well, you know, uh, yeah. as uh, students. Yeah, absolutely. Anything we could do in our classroom to model that that's okay. Um, and just know that it's a, a safe space to, to make those mistakes and to speak with an accent. It's totally normal. You know, you're not going to be perfect right off the bat or even ever, right? Accents are normal. There's nothing wrong with having an accent. Um, yeah, I, I, I hate that too. I hate being in France, you know, and, and feeling self-conscious about my accent because I, I do at times, um, but we really shouldn't, we, we wouldn't want our students to feel that way. So our, ourselves, we, we shouldn't feel that way either. But, um, I, I love that. I love that you had mentioned too, that you don't like immediately point out the mistakes, but rather you, you repeat what they say or rephrase what they say so that they could hear it the correct way. And then if you need to um, privately point it out to them, um, if they continue to do that, I really like that, but let's. Good. Yeah. yeah. I find it's kind of like a smooth thing, right? Cause you can just yeah. like type it up and then they, they can mm -hmm. see it. Oh, if you go back to mention two uh, yeah. uh, coaches, but uh, actually it's neither, neither, it's not Zagalo. It's also not Pareira. I forgot his name for now. 
for oh, I, I'll, I'll remember I, uh, it, then I'll mention it later. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't but, I can't give any help with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, gentle humor is one way to lower anxiety. Okay. Never use hum humor at a student's expense. Absolutely. I start off a new group by offering them funny things about myself. Uh, the fact that I view chocolate as a vegetable. Hmm. Or my love for Legolas. <laughs> Wait, what? what is That's that? awesome. What is that? Leg is, uh, Legolas is from uh, Lord of the Rings. Okay. He was played by, uh, what's that actor? He uh, He's a good actor. He also, he was also in the Pirates of the Caribbean. But anyway, mm -hmm. he's the he's the elf in uh, Lord of okay. the Rings. So okay, she... <laughs> I love that. Orlando Bloom, Orlando Bloom, exactly. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That was so really I, cool. I've definitely seen Lord of the Rings, but I didn't. I'm not very good at, at knowing the the character's name, but I know exactly who you're talking about. I love that you use that though to as takeoff points or funny asides in future lessons. That's really that's really great. And when the students are laughing, they feel more comfortable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And hopefully Duolingo helps with students laughing as well, right? That they, all these like silly sentences that they come across, it's definitely um, designed specifically for that reason, to make it fun, to make it memorable, of course. Um, but again, to make students laugh, as you're mentioning here. Thank you for sharing. Multiple people knew it was Orlando Bloom. Okay, well, I'm embarrassed. Now, but <laughs> I'm yeah, not I forgot his name. <laughs> I'm not going to remember it. Legolas. Names actors names or even um, names of series or movies that I've watched and I've enjoyed I'm not necessarily going to remember people's names there are exceptions, but... <laughs> <laughs> all right so keep sharing your ideas these are great ideas everyone and as I mentioned um, I'll choose two Duolingo plushie winners a little later on but um, let's talk a little bit more I'll jump off again sounds good so uh, basically when I talk about the effective filter like i i like to uh especially in my experience as a language learner and then of course i see it in my students as well i like to add two extra elements to just basically um contribute to the lowering of the effect of the effective filter and the first one being individual relevance of uh of content because what i uh what i find that uh, at least for me as a language learner, can be so uh, demotivating and just so, um, uh, I get so annoyed when I'm, I buy some material or uh, I start studying or I start using a method or whatever for learning a specific language and I come across content that I just feel is not relevant for me in, or uh, I don't know, like sometimes it's just kind of like classic stuff like, oh, let's learn, you know, uh, bathroom items, just the you know, towel, soap, a doormat. Let's just like learn this little list of vocab that I'm probably not never going to use or, uh, or like I'm going to use like maybe once a year or something. So I find that like if we, we if we zoom in and we just like give the students the tools to just uh, find content that's highly relevant to them, that really lowers the, the effective fil filter and uh, they're going to be able to absorb content uh a lot more uh especially like you know especially focusing on something that they're really interested in so let's say that a student really likes um i don't know like k-pop and they're learning korean right so if they're really interested in k-pop uh just basically why not focus on vocab that's actually relevant uh to even have a, a conversation about k-pop or uh music or korean dramas or whatever something that really excites them and it's that's individually that's relevant to them individually so if we boost individual relevance that's going to lower the filter uh as well of course we could like make reference to the other three elements of the of the filter but like uh, like you know that they'll like lower anxiety or um uh, you know but <laughs> basically i like to see it as this, almost like a separate element and um uh and the, the second element which is kind of connected anyway, is just, as I mentioned before in the, uh, with the, uh, which C was it? The consequence uh, C for, for motivation is excitement, really. Like if we can manage to get the students really, really excited about the language. Uh, and of course, like, you know, uh, I, I know that like in some, cir some circumstances, it's like if we're teaching languages in a, in a classroom, 
uh, and they're just there to to get their their grade and move on and you know and forget about French or Spanish or whatever language you're learning later. Of course, it's not going to be that easy to just like get them stoked about the language. But uh, I I find it interesting that I'm able to get, for instance, I attract a lot of students uh, with my YouTube channel because I'm able to to show them the consequences of language learning uh, at a social level. And they, then they get excited about it and they see the possibility and they're like, oh, you know what? Oh, I want to be able to travel like Gabriel and connect with people from all over the world and uh, have a lot of, uh, have a very big male audience, for instance, on YouTube. I think that maybe close to 80% of my audience on, on YouTube is basically guys between the ages of 18 and 25, I think. And a lot of them are just like, oh, wow, I want to learn a language to just flirt with girls abroad. And uh, so that they get very excited about it. And that's actually an element that's also going to lower the effective uh, filter. And uh, so th those are two elements that I, I really see that uh, can really contribute um, to the lowering of the effective filter in my experience. And um, I think we can go to the next slide. Merci. Now, oh yeah, I put questions before the recommendations. So I think that we could, we could do it uh, whatever way Bridget would, would like. We can ask have the questions now or- I, uh, Am I missing a slide? Did I miss something? Oh, no, actually, I think that I, no, no go to the following slide. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. So like, I think that I should have put the recommendations before the questions. Okay, so that's okay. Yeah. If there are any questions, um, feel free to stop us and I'm I'm happy to to interrupt, but we'll we'll talk a little bit about recommendations. Sounds good. So I uh, I just put some recommendations down because you know I, I I could go on all day with them, but I uh, I'll just mention a few that come to my mind to sort of you know basically lower the filter, as well as boost uh, self motivation for uh, the students. I think that uh, for instance, like an app like Duolingo is just uh, so much fun, right? So if we can just like if teachers have the opportunity to just uh, let students do some homework or, or get some extra marks by do, uh, just do, doing a lot of Duolingo, that can be fun, right? And Duolingo can lower uh, a bit of anxiety because it's, it's, it's fun, right? It's, a, it's an enjoyable app. And, uh, and it can also contribute to the student self-confidence because, you know, they start uh, succeeding. They, they'll make mistakes, but then like they can get a, a few lessons that are perfect and they're going to be like, oh, you know what? I can, I can be good at this. <laughs> Uh, another thing that I that I like to talk about, I always talk about this. I um, I do I have to do a lot of. Um, oh, sorry. I was gonna. I'm gonna talk about managing expectations. Then I'll go to the showing the consequences. I think that, like, especially like in Brazil, because of uh, really aggressive marketing, and often like straight up like ridiculous marketing that promises uh, impossible things, like oh. Uh, fluency in a month like become fluent in english uh with their program in a matter of seven days which is just absolutely insane and ridiculous so a lot of people don't don't even know what to expect uh from language learning or uh and i see that like for instance in canada as well they're like oh yeah oh, oh, i don't know like i'll become fluent in um uh, in whatever language by doing i don't know like a month of rosetta stone or whatever so you find that I find it so important to just like really manage the expectations of the of the students, and especially for instance, in let's say that a, a student is in high school uh, and he's going to do Spanish, right? Uh, some students will be under the impression that after a year or whatever that they're going to be completely fluent by simply attending the class, barely doing the homework, and uh, and that's not. So I think that it's just so important to just really really be like, you know what, like uh, fluency is just like, uh, it's something that's not gonna be attained that easily, right? But if you if you do choose to uh, pursue certain recommendations that I'm gonna give you, you will succeed in language learning and you will be able to have a chat with native speakers if you so, if that's what you desire, right? So I think that it's really important to just like manage the student, uh, student's expectations um, so that they, because otherwise they're going to be like, oh yeah, I've done three years of Spanish in high school and it's useless. I can't even have a chat with native speakers uh, after all this time. But it's just kind of like, well, like, did you put time like uh, 
did you do the right things like outside of the classroom as well? Or did you just like scrape by and barely did your homework and got a, a B grade, but, uh, and then later expected to just like speak fluent Spanish, right? So I think that that's just so important. Um, as I mentioned before, showing the consequences of language learning, right? And how, because I really, I really see that students don't fully grasp, they never fully grasp the, the amazingness, how epic it can be to master a for, or, or even get, a, get to a conversational level in a second, third, or fourth language, however many they want to learn. Uh, if, we if we manage to really show the consequences and uh, show like, look, maybe if, if they're in high school, like well, when you go to, to college, maybe you can take, a, you can do a, a, a year abroad and you're going to meet all these amazing people. You're going you're gonna to have such a great time in Paris or Rome or uh, I don't know, Tokyo or whatever you want to go. And uh, showing these consequences, I think that can really, really help and just like fire up the motivation, right? <clears throat> Lowering anxiety. So uh, some teachers like posted some awesome recommendations or like uh, uh, what they do already, right? Like, so music and uh, games and so on. I think that it's just so important to just, especially when there's just like so much uh, pressure, right? To just uh, um, help the students just like succeed in the next exam. Like, oh yeah, I want you guys to do well. So then there's a pressure to do well. If the students fail or get a C, then they're upset. And uh, so I think that it's just so important for us to try to lower the anxiety in whatever way we can by game, gamifying or, or doing uh, whatever, right? Like a fun project on the side if possible. And um, also like something that I always try to do as soon as possible, right? Like give them the tools that will help them interact with native uh, speakers. So I, I always try to focus a lot on just, you know, uh, being able to get students to have a, a little chat, even just initially, right? To just like, uh, I'm sure most of you guys do the same, but like, I think it's just like so uh, cool to to let them know that, you know, if you do, uh, if you don't just focus on the grammar or, or like a, just straight up vocab lists or whatever, try to really focus on developing the ability to just at the beginning, even just, just have a little chat with the native speaker. And uh, there's so many ways to do that nowadays, right? They can go on, a, I don't know, Omegle, where they can go, they can play a, uh, some video game and connect with people from all over the world and, uh, and try to interact with them. And that can be a lot of fun and that will help them see the consequences as well. Um, also, differentiation in uh, in the output. I think that uh, that's something really cool. If whenever teachers ha can do that, I think that they should. So, for instance, like uh, um, you know, if a student can like, have a if the if the teacher can give a, give a project and tell the student, okay, you know what? Maybe uh, you've learned um, this specific verb. This the the you're learning irregular verbs verbs in Spanish. Uh, so just like do this little project, it can be like a three minute, minute video, or it can be, it can be a, a little essay or whatever you want, basically, to show that you've mastered that specific um, thing, right? Like that specific thing that you're supposed to learn. Um, I think that, that that is actually so important because like different students are going to want to do different things, right? And, uh, and sometimes it's just kind of like, oh, I really, I really don't feel like just uh, putting it on paper, I would prefer to um, do a video in front of the camera or just like even record myself like uh, chatting with a different person. If, there, if students are given the choice, right, to uh, do a project like with different output, I think that that can be really valuable as well. And, uh, and one thing that I always like to mention is just the, the thematic clustering versus semantic clustering, right? Because I find personally as a, as a language learner, I find it so incredibly useless to just like focus, focusing on, uh, if I focus on learning just long lists uh, of vocab uh, of things that are related, right? So just like if I just sit there and I try to memorize like, uh, I don't know, like um, kitchen items, like fork, uh, spoon, you know, and I try to just hammer that into my head, I find it so useless. But, you know, but with thematic clustering, like, so basically you try to, get the student to just like really put that uh, like in con like always in context, just like ma uh, master vocab 
um, vocabulary surrounding like a, sp a specific theme or topic. Uh, and I find that like really, especially if the student has the choice uh, to actually focus on a topic or theme that they really like, right? So that goes back to just the, the individual relevance as well. So these are my, uh, my recommendations. And uh, I think that now we can go back to the questions. <laughs> I'm not seeing any questions. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's a good, good. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, but shall we shall we stop recording and maybe allow everyone to turn on their mics and their cameras if they would like to just introduce themselves sure. to um to ask questions live if they prefer. Of course, this is optional, no, no need to um to do that, but um yeah, let's do that, shall we? Let me let me sh stop sharing 